Hello and welcome to Green Badger's Lead Submittal Guide, a tool for subcontractors. You're here because you're working on a project that has a lead certification requirement and we need your help. We're going to cover what is lead, what is the subcontractor's role in lead, how to fill out a lead cover sheet, provide you with some resources, and give you a quick summary. To begin with, what is LEED certification? You might already know that LEED is a green building rating system developed by the U.S. Green Building Council, which serves as a third-party certification for all LEED projects. So what does that mean for you as a subcontractor? Well, you play a vital and important role in helping the project team earn its overall LEED certification. To start with, we need your help documenting all the materials you provide within your scope of work. For the products you've specified, what do they cost and how do they contribute to a variety of lead credits? Most of those details are in the project specifications and are a required part of your overall product submittal. We're going to show you what lead documentation looks like and the importance of the lead cover sheet. The lead cover sheet is just like your normal submittal cover sheet in that it identifies what products you're using and what they cost. But the lead cover sheet goes a step further to show what lead attributes these products have that could help the project earn certification. A complete lead submittal shows that the project is staying within the thresholds of its certification requirements on a credit by credit basis. This is an example of a cover sheet that we're using to track products and lead attributes throughout the course of the submittal process. It's really important that you provide this information. Otherwise, product data tends to get lost in translation. This can have a negative impact on the submittal review process, which can lead to delays, penalties, and the dreaded revise and resubmit throughout the submittal process. So let's start with the basics. The lead cover sheet asks what products you're using, who manufactures those products, and what is the estimated cost of each product. The cost is the material cost only. Fabrication and installation labor are excluded. In this example, we're using USG, and we have two different sheetrock products as well as a sealant. It's very important to break out each specific type of product and the cost associated with each product. You can't just put sheetrock and then a $15,000 lump sum because each product has a different lead attribute or the potential for different lead attributes. So step one, identify each product you're using, list them individually in a separate line item and show product costs excluding any labor. Next, we're going to look for any lead attributes that these products might have. Products could potentially have environmental product declarations or recycled content. Wood products could possibly have forest stewardship certification, and there are some products that have take back programs, which means that the manufacturer will take back the product and recycle it at the end of its useful life. Ingredient reporting is another type of attribute that a product could have. Ingredient reports tell us what products are made of. These reports include health product declarations, declare labels, and cradle to cradle certificates, as well as some others. Let's first take a look at environmental product declarations, or EPD for short. EPDs show us the overall environmental footprint of a product. These fall into two different types. The most common kind is a product specific EPD, such as the one on the left. This EPD is for a specific product and a specific manufacturer. In this case, the manufacturer is Owens Corning and the product is thermofiber mineral wool insulation. This EPD cannot be used for any other Owens Corning product, such as their pink insulation. This particular EPD only applies to thermofiber mineral wool. The other type of EPD is called industry-wide. This is when an industry group got together 
and created a common EPD around a generic product. If your manufacturer is listed on the industry-wide EPD, then you can use it in your submittal. In this case, for the EPD on the right, the product is Type X gypsum board. It doesn't specifically have to say USG Type X gypsum board. So the product specific EPD will show you a very specific product and specific manufacturer, whereas the industry wide EPD covers industry averages or generic products that teams can use as well. The next step is just making sure the EPD is valid. And this information is usually on the first and second pages. Ensure that the certification date is within the time of construction. In the example you're looking at, the EPD was issued in November of 2017 and is valid for five years up to November of 2022. There's also a section on the lead cover sheet for you to note if the EPD has internal or external verification. And you can see next to the green hours we've provided where you can find the date and the box that is checked either internal or external. So now you can check back to the individual line item and make a note if the product had an industry-wide or product-specific EPD. Next up is sourcing of raw materials. There are five ways to earn this credit, but most often products have an extended producer responsibility program, a fancy name for a take-back program, FSC certified wood, or recycled content. It's very uncommon to see bio-based materials salvage materials, or material reuse. An extended producer responsibility program, or take-back program, is when a manufacturer has a program in place to divert product from landfill and recycle that product after it's been removed from the building at the end of its useful life. In the example you're looking at, Armstrong recycles ceiling tiles from renovation projects. The ceiling tiles can be packed and ship back to Armstrong to be recycled into new ceiling tiles. All you need to do is provide the brochure from the company website showing what the manufacturer takes back, how to package it, and where to ship it, along with the cost of the product. Next, for wood products only, is Forest Stewardship Council Wood. All FSC products need to have an FSC number and a vendor invoice showing both the product and the cost with the FSC number on it. Last is recycle content. This is by far the most common attribute that you will find for the sourcing of raw materials credit. Something to keep in mind is that lead reviewers will not accept a cut sheet or letter from a manufacturer that shows total recycle content. It has to be broken down as either post-consumer recycle content and or pre-consumer recycle content. It can be one or the other or both. Another word for pre-consumer is post-industrial and it means exactly the same thing. In this example, you can see that this new core steel made at the Huger South Carolina plant has a 50.6 post-consumer recycle content and a 10.4 pre-consumer recycle content. Another example of this is a testing data sheet. You can see that the NAUF installation has 20% post-consumer and 41% pre-consumer recycled content. All you need for documentation is a one-page cut sheet or letter from the manufacturer that shows the pre and or post-consumer recycled content. So as we fill out the lead cover sheet, if a product is FSC certified, simply put yes. In our example here, there is no FSC certified wood product, so we put no. If on the other hand, the product has recycled content, you would fill out very specifically the post and or pre-consumer recycled content. In addition, if the product has a take back program, simply type yes under the extended producer responsibility field. And don't forget to include the supporting documentation we've already mentioned. Next, we'll take a look at material ingredient reporting. Once again, ingredient reports tell us what a product is made of. As you can see in this slide, there are many certifications that meet lead requirements, but most common by far are health product declarations, 
cradle to cradle, and declare labels. Here, you're looking at an example of a health product declaration. You can see in the upper right that it's a health product declaration. And even though these run up to 14 pages, and you should include all the pages, there's just a few pieces of information you need on pages one and two. First, check the threshold level. The material must be inventory to 100 or 1,000 parts per million to be LEED compliant. Also, the substances in the product need to be characterized and screened, so those boxes have to be checked. Also, make sure that the date is valid during construction. Cradle to cradle certificates are one page and they'll tell you what the product is, the manufacturer, the level of certification, the revision number, and the date. In this case, the product has a silver cradle to cradle material health achievement and a platinum cradle to cradle material health certificate. And finally, we have an example of a declare label which tells you what a product is made of in a tidy one page document. Just make sure the date is valid for the course of construction. To fill this out, simply go to the material ingredient column on the lead cover sheet and enter the type of ingredient reporting you have that goes with each product. And if there is no material ingredient reporting for your product, simply leave that field blank. The last thing we need to look at is low emitting materials. Lead reviewers look at products in the building, both from a sustainability side of things, as well as to see if the product emits harmful gases and chemicals into the building. Lead looks at eight categories of products. If you don't provide products in any of these categories, you don't need to worry about filling in the low emitting portion of the cover sheet or providing documentation. The eight categories include paints and coatings, any adhesives and sealants, flooring products, wall products, ceiling products, insulation products, furniture, and composite wood. For adhesives, sealants, paints, and coatings, three pieces of information must be provided. The quantity used, shown in volume, the VOC content, VOC stands for volatile organic content, and an emission certificate that shows CDPH compliance. CDPH stands for the California Department of Public Health. All the other categories are tracked by cost and only need to meet the CDPH compliance shown on the emission certificate. CDPH certificates are provided by a number of organizations. UL Green Guard Gold is one of the most common certificates and is our example for this Sherwin-Williams product. It shows the manufacturer of the product, the certification period, and a section that shows the product has been tested in accordance with the California Department of Public Health 2017 standard. This type of emission certificate is required for any product in any of the eight categories that we've mentioned to be considered compliant. The next section has to do with the range of the total VOCs. In this example, it's 0.5 or less. There's really no right or wrong number for the range, but you do need a document that shows what the range is. Looking back at the lead cover sheet, the first two products are wall products, so we need to include an emission certificate that meets the CDPH standard. The sealant falls into the adhesives and sealants category, so this also needs to meet the compliance requirements. For the sealant, we need an emission certificate and we need to show the VOC content. VOC content can be found in an MSDS sheet, a product data sheet, or a lab certificate. We also need to show the volume. How much sealant do you intend to use on the project? Other examples of low emitting certificates include indoor advantage gold certificates. You can see here in this example, it meets the CDPH testing standard. There's also SES Global Floor Score. And Green Label Plus is very commonly used to certify carpets and carpet adhesives. These certificates also show that the product meets the CDPH testing standard and shows the TVOC range. 
Here's an example of a Benjamin Moore product data sheet showing the VOC content. MSDS sheets typically will show VOC content in Section 9, but whichever document you use, you're looking for the VOC in grams per liter, and this is the number you'll record on the cover sheet. Just in case one of your projects includes composite wood, MDF, plywood, any type of wood that is glued together, the certificate needs to show that it's either ultra low emitting or has no added formaldehyde resins. Lead projects need the actual CARB or EPA document to show that the product is compliant. So the finished product shows all of the attributes. We started with who the manufacturer is, what is the product, and how much did it cost? Next, you get into material attributes. Does it have recycled content? Does it have extended producer responsibility? If it's a wood product, does it have FSC certification? And finally, does it have any type of material ingredient reporting? And recapping on low emitting materials, is the product an adhesive, sealant, paint, or coating? If so, provide the volume, VOC, content, and CDPH. Is the product a wall, ceiling, insulation, flooring product, composite wood product, or furniture? If so, you need the CDPH and cost. In addition to filling out the cover sheet, it's very important to, to include all of the documentation with all of the pages. In this example, we have an EPD for the sheetrock, a health product declaration for the sheetrock, and an emission certificate showing that it is CDPH compliant. Every product listed in your cover sheet needs the backup documentation for the submittal to be accepted. And finally, where do we find these documents? A lot of these will be provided to you by the manufacturer, but if you need to look for more information, here are some organizations. You can find a number of environmental product declarations from UL Spot, which also provides Green Guard Gold certificates, and there's also SDS Global, ASTM, and NSF, all of which have websites. Ingredient reporting is done by a variety of organizations, but generally this information should be provided by your manufacturer. So to summarize, subcontractors play a vital role in helping teams earn their LEED certification. You are masters of your domain when it comes to knowing what products can be used and how they should be used. Lead project teams just need a little bit of help identifying material costs, volumes, and any sustainability attributes that a product might have to help the project meet its overarching lead goals. Green Badger is committed to its vision of making sustainability accessible, attainable, and effortless for the entire construction industry.